In this video, we discuss one of the most pivotal and tumultuous episodes in modern Chinese history, and this is the Boxer Uprising and the suppression of the Boxers, which shortly followed. To understand this moment in history, we need to go back to an earlier topic to uh, remind ourselves where we are in time and space. And in particular, I'm referring here to the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1895. I discussed the Treaty of Shimonoseki and the implications or repercussions of that treaty, but we also need to expand our view somewhat to be able to understand the lasting impact of this war on the trajectory of uh, modern Chinese history more broadly, but in particular, the history of Euro-Japanese, Euro-American Japanese colonialism within China. In a nutshell, Japan's victory in 1895 triggered or contributed to something of a colonial feeding frenzy. Many people have heard of the scramble for Africa, in which a variety of European states competed with one another to, to acquire and gobble up territory, basically in a competitive framework, fearing that if they were not the ones to colonize and subjugate African peoples and territories, that competitor European states would, and that would place them at a disadvantage. Well, something comparable, although on a far smaller scale, took place in China at roughly the same time. We have what is sometimes referred to as the scramble for concessions, and here concessions refers to those territories that are under these special extraterritoriality agreements and other treaty agreements, um, like we've seen going all the way back to the aftermath of the First Opium War. Well, a few of these scrambles for concessions were particularly aggressive, involving Great Britain, Germany, and Russia. Uh, in the case of Germany, the uh, aggression, uh, colonial aggression to acquire territories and concessions in China uh, brought Germany into the area of uh, Qingdao, the city of Qingdao and its environs. And uh, for anyone who has ever heard of Qingdao beer, the reason that that beer is so delicious and so good is that in effect it is a German beer. This was for a long time a central to the German concession area within China. And for the great uh, the side of Great Britain, 1898, this was the pivotal year in this history, 1898 marked the British acquisition of a much larger expanse of territory known as the New Territories in and around Hong Kong. And uh, this was brought into uh, under British control, not as a form of annexation, but under this new technology of colonial expansion and imperialism, the 99-year lease. So in the case of Great Britain and also of Germany and also of Russia in other parts of Northeast Asia, the, basically a 99-year lease agreement was foisted upon the Chinese government. And it's for that reason, uh, if you think 1898 and you add 99 years to it, that is the reason why the retrocession of Hong Kong, which happens in the late 20th century, happened when it did. Uh, because in essence, the 99-year lease ran out, and that became the moment that legally Great Britain had to hand back uh, all of these territories, these new territories, back to, back to China. So 1898 is this absolutely pivotal year in which European colonialism uh, achieved or accelerated to this just raw politic, this power politic, mocked politic phase in which by and large the European states were hardly even concealing the fact that they were looking for any excuse, large or small, to justify military action and at gunpoint forcing the Qing state to one or another uh, new treaty or to one of these 99-year leases. Now, why is this going to be so important for our upcoming discussion in this video of the boxers? Well, this increased aggression, just bald-face aggression by uh, European colonialists is going to help foment, for the first time in Chinese history, something like 
popular or mass nationalism. Uh, so we've already talked about state leaders and emperors and counselors and, you know, these individuals for whom a, a, a large-scale understanding of Qing China or the Qing or the Ming is quite common. I mean, they, 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 their job is to rule this empire, uh, and they are aware of things happening in the southwest or in the northwest or rebellions here and there. They have this, this bird's-eye view picture. The average peasant who is trying to survive existence does not have this view, and in fact, the term China or Chinese as a national concept doesn't even exist. In fact, later, Chinese nationalists will openly lament the fact that we don't even have a word for our country. Foreigners call us China, but we don't have a word for ourselves. Well, around 1898, there is beginning to foment at the lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, among the non-literate, among the laboring, among the peasantry, a sense of the us and them, of us and these foreigners, who are coming in increased numbers, who are um, operating with increased sort of brazenness because they know that they have their, their home country behind them. And so if they're harassed or if, they're, if their person is assaulted or, if, you know, God forbid someone is attacked or murdered or, a, you know, a church is burnt down, they know that the full power of Britain or Germany or France or of Russia is going to come to its aid. So the sort of arrogance and brazenness with this increasing number of foreigners is starting to be felt at the local level. And without that, you know, environment, without that uh, framework, there is no way to understand how the boxer uprising as this popular bottom-up movement takes shape in the way that it does. So with that, let's jump into the more proximate questions uh, and proximate factors in understanding the Boxer Uprising.